We'd like to now move into uh, session five of the Economic Summit. This session is on empowering takeoff, efficient government and progressive state enterprises. Uh, and we have joining us virtually, uh, Tan Sri Dato Azman Mokhtar, who is former MD of Kazana National uh, uh, Berhad, and also uh, Mr. Sajid Atigala, who is, uh, will be continuing on this session. Our moderator for this session is Manjula De Silva, Secretary General and CEO of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, and he will introduce the rest of the panel. Good morning and a warm welcome to session five of the Sri Lanka Economic Summit uh, 2020. The session theme is empowering takeoff, efficient government and progressive state enterprises, which relates very closely to the conference theme of roadmap for takeoff, driving a people-centric economic revival. So in this session, we will shift our focus to the public sector, which makes an important contribution both to the GDP, as well as to employment in the context of a mixed economy. In fact, the public sector employs about 20% of the total workforce in the country. And the public sector also provides many vital services, which are essential for the private sector to carry on with its operations. So in this session, we will focus on the role the government and its enterprises will play in driving the economic recovery. As the Honorable Prime Minister stated in inaugurating today's proceedings, public sector institutions perform a critical role in the economy and it is essential to keep them people-centric and focused on meeting the needs of the public. So if we look at our topic, it's made up of two components. Efficient government that looks at the core of the government. So here we include the ministries, departments, and the other non-commercial agencies. Then in the second component, we will be looking at the commercial state enterprises that belong to the state. So we have two very eminent speakers uh, to deal with these two aspects and a very knowledgeable panel of four who will join the panel discussion and will examine this topic further. So let me now introduce the speakers and the panel. As the speakers, we have Tansri Dato Asman Mokhtar, former MD of Khazana, Malaysia, and Mr. Sajit Artigala, Secretary to the Treasury and Secretary, Ministry of Finance. And the panel will comprise Mrs. Dara Vijay Tilaka, our former CEO and Secretary General of the Ceylon Chamber, and a former Secretary of several ministries. And she's also currently the chairperson of the Office for Reparations. We also have Mr. Dumit Panandu on my left, uh, Chairman of the Columbus Stock Exchange and Chairman Asia Securities Holdings. Uh, then also joining the panel will be Dr. Roshan Pereira, a former central banker and currently an independent consultant, and Dr. Malati Knight, research associate of Verite Research, who has published extensively on SOE reforms and related subjects. So we will have uh, two speeches of approximately 15 minutes each, and thereafter we'll move into the panel discussion, which will roughly take about an hour. So you can post your questions uh, using the Q&A tab and I will try to pick up as many as possible uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, so to open the session, now let me invite Tansri Dato Asman Mokta, former MD of Kazana, Malaysia, to speak on progressive state enterprises. Yeah, let me thank you very much, uh, Mr. Manjula. I hope my screen is appearing on your screen. Um, 
hopefully that that's okay. Uh, thank you for once again inviting me and uh, on this important topic. Uh, I prepared a set of slides, uh, which are rather busy slides, I must say, but is there intended to be as a reference? I will quickly run through, mindful that uh, you know we we have a, a panel that I'm sure we can we can discuss further. Uh, I have three uh, really key points to make. I think first, uh, from the standpoint of uh, what Kazana has done over a, a roughly about a 14, 15 year journey, and I was the CEO for that, um, for that period of, uh, of uh, uh, about 14 years. Um, and then secondly, I want to run through 10, 10 factors which I see as the so-called critical success factors, but also to be balanced to highlight what were some of the limits and limitations of our program. We were not completely successful in everything, obviously, and there were limits. Uh, nonetheless, I think there was much that was achieved during that 14, 15 year period. And finally, to close off with uh, what could possibly be lessons that may or may not be applicable in, in other jurisdictions, eh? including Sri Lanka. Uh, okay, first of all, Kazana, as some of you know, but for, for general information, we are the so-called uh, Strategic Investment Fund of Malaysia. Uh, by the time I left, I think it was managing close to about 40 billion US dollars. During my 14-year term, we managed to treble the value of the portfolio roughly about three and a half times. Uh, one distinguishing facet of Kazana is that uh, unlike many sovereign wealth funds around the world, it did not receive money coming from all revenue, for example, would go to Petronas or money in the foreign reserves were managed by our central bank or pension money was managed by several pension funds. So Kazana essentially had as its starting capital, uh, essentially state-owned enterprises or what we call government-linked companies. And the difference between government-linked companies and SOE is that SOEs are 100% owned by the government. GLCs are not majority, uh, they are not 100% owned. Uh, typically, many of these are listed. So uh, I think that's one aspect. I think roughly, Kazana is a, as the uh, holding company, we had about 480 employees, so not that many. But the companies under us that we control directly and we took an active role in managing these companies was uh, roughly about 200,000 employees. Eh? Okay, um, I think briefly, our view of what is successful uh, implementation of our work is to look for three types of returns, if I can call it that. Eh? The first one is, of course, as an investment house, the financial returns. The second part is what we call strategic returns. And this is translated in terms of uh, how do we help with the national development efforts? How do we help with job creation? How do we help with industrial policy? How do we do special economic zones, for example, or to develop new sectors or to restructure older sectors? Eh? So you, and, and eventually, it was also a process of regionalizing our companies. And finally, we also think uh, today is very, uh, I would say even fashionable or required to think in terms of ESG. Uh, but you know, this was back in the early 2000s, we were already looking at societal returns whether this is in terms of inclusivity and how to reduce inequality and CSR and so on and so forth. I won't run through the numbers because uh, there's a lot of details. I said, I'll, I'll leave that for reference if, if required. Um, and it's not just Kazana, there's something called the GLC transformation program, which I'll come to in a while. And the new economic model that was launched an economic vision by the government during this time. So we, 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 um, you know, we delivered the, the so-called financial returns by so many metrics um, you know, that we were able to do this without incurring uh, you know, a level of debt that was not sustainable and so on and so forth, right? And also to note that dividends and taxes, and this is quite critical, it goes back to the treasury, to the government, uh, to the various pension funds, also multiplied uh, many times over. And to recognize that this came from a period in 2004 when the previous 20 years, actually, many of these companies were struggling quite badly and underperforming. Uh, in terms of the 
economic or strategic uh, outcomes, as mentioned, you know, there are several uh, examples here, uh, as well as societal outcomes. Now, so while Kazana was managing about 40 uh, billion US dollars eventually, uh, we were also tasked to be the driver and the secretariat to also come up with an overarching program that we call our GLC transformation program for other funds and related funds. And actually, if you total all that up, uh, roughly about 450 to 500 billion US dollars. So it's about 10 times the size of Kazana itself, but we were made the secretariat of this and we drove this from the year 2005 until 2015. It was a 10 year program. Uh, we had, uh, and, and one of the key success factors was uh, this committee was chaired by the prime minister himself and there were 29 meetings during that 10 years. Eh? So, so it was a very, uh, what you call it, robust uh, program that was managed as a program. And Kazana was the one doing the design and the driving of this. And this is where the biggest gains were coming because it wasn't just our companies, but this were a lot of the other related companies. If you add these companies, which is probably roughly about one third of the, of the stock market, plus Petronas, which was not in this program because they were deemed to be already fairly advanced. In, in fact, we, we use a lot of their practices. Uh, uh, Petronas is a Fortune 500 you know, international company, as you know. Uh, you know, then we are talking about a very large chunk of the Malaysian economy, not, not unlike what we heard. So very quickly, there are 10 factors, which I'll run through very quickly, that I felt, uh, you know, on looking back, what were the key things that made a difference? Uh, I grouped them into three main buckets. The first one, getting the mandate right, which is clarity in terms of thinking, in terms of uh, strategy. The second one is really you before you go into battle i think you need to get the capacity building and drivers right these are necessary preconditions and finally uh getting the execution right and the devil is really in the execution details i think is, is and the 10 points i would say uh, the first one is that to to think through and every country will have your own set of balance we landed on three three we had three objectives maybe that's too much some say you must have only one objective but this is a complex situation, right? And these are state-owned enterprises and GLCs. First of all, we felt, and, and the backdrop in 2004, this came after the Asian financial crisis in Malaysia. 98 to 2000, 2001, Malaysia successfully stabilized the economy using what the IMF would call, you know, rather, rather heterodox, uh, unconventional methods, which later they recognized using capital controls and so on but the corporate restructuring was still needed to be done. So therefore, the first objective, performance, efficiency, productivity, productivity, value creation, were very important objectives that we had. But this cannot be divorced from national development kind of factors, including jobs, economic multipliers, and so on. And the third one, we felt that good governance, uh, corporate governance, but also governance on the part of the government was required. Uh, and and good governance is not just an, an, an enabler in our sense that it was also not just a means, but an end in itself. Because I think inherently, we think that this is very important to build institutions, basically. The second one is to get national support. So a degree of national consensus, obviously, uh, very important. This is a long game. Uh, you have to stay the course. And therefore, understanding stakeholder groups, and there are many, uh, from labor unions to supplier base and and uh, and private sector etc right because you must not crowd out you must crowd in and this actually takes a lot of time of course it helps very much that the reforms actually started under our fourth prime minister dr mahade uh, it was programmed and launched under our fifth prime minister abdullah badawi and continued under prime minister number six uh, najib raza later i'll come what happened dr mahade came back as prime minister number seven uh, then there was a shift in uh, policy that there was less emphasis on uh, state-owned enterprise and GLC, which, which is fine, which is, as you will see, that the pendulum often swings between these two. Eh? Uh, the communication, transparency, public accountability. KPIs were not just KPIs, but they were announced publicly, actually, and people were brought to account. Uh, there were regular public updates, uh, you know, rain or shine, uh, for example, every January, I would have to face the whole public 
uh, of the results of Kazana, and it can be quite brutal sometimes when you know you've had a not a so good year, and so on and so forth. But you know, I, I went through 14 of these over 14 years. Uh, the fourth factor I would say is, and this is a consideration. Some countries have it, some countries don't. Uh, Tamase in Singapore, for example, is one model that we studied. Mubadala in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, Malaysia went down the road. In fact, Kazana was there from 1994, but it was not active. It was more passive. So in our model, to do this, you need an active, competent, and empowered uh, holding company. And Kazana was identified. I was brought in. I came from the private sector. I was an investment banker and so on and so forth. And many came and joined, joined this together, right? Uh, so this is one consideration. As I said, uh, uh, Turkey, for example, has recently taken this up. In fact, the gentleman running the Turkish fund was one of my, our, our senior guys. He was the guy running our, our Istanbul office, uh, has been picked to, to run uh, the, the Turkish wealth fund. Number five, we already spoke about a program management approach. Number six is extremely critical that uh, this is a quite com complex task in that sense. Therefore, you do need the right talent and leadership at CEO at board, senior management level, right? Number seven is what I call transformation acupuncture. You, you can't boil the whole ocean. So we, we spent a lot of time thinking through what were the areas that was most critical. We identified 10. Uh, we issued out uh, quite uh, detailed implementation uh, around things like governance, around things like procurement, around performance-based compensation, etc. They happen to be colored differently, and over time, they became known as the rainbow colored books. It's actually available. It's, it's a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, many countries actually have, have borrowed this, and, you know, there's no uh, trademark or anything, and, and uh, obviously it has to be, uh, you know, suited for local applicability. Number eight, accountability via both so called carrot and stick. We talked about the KPIs. Uh, people were incentivized on performance-based compensation, which was kind of uh, based on average market, uh, based on, uh, you know, so these were actually better, uh, generally better, and because these companies perform, uh, you know, many actually got much better pay, not just the senior management, but further down the line. But the senior management was subjected to three-year performance contracts, so no more life and job security. And the appointment process were quite robust, I would say. Uh, the ninth one is sometimes forgotten, but getting the key sectors or industries right in terms of your policy mix. And these are sectors like electricity, telecommunications, banking, aviation, infrastructure. Uh, so these are sector strategies, regulation, pricing strategies, social policy. It's extremely key in our, in our experience because obviously this will have a big impact. And finally, the use of the levers of ownership, uh, financing, and controls. So between, so for example, uh, there are about 1,000 SOEs in Malaysia. Our program actually covers only about 200, but that's about 80% of the value, right? So we need to be clear in our minds which were principally commercial and which were principally social. Take an example, public transport. We concluded that this was principally a social, uh, it has some commercial aspect, but it was principally of a social service, unlike, say, telecommunications and banking, right? Because this is important to give clarity in terms of how to run uh, these companies. At the same time, to have some clarity about what were the appropriate legal entities to house them. Uh, in this case, for example, whether these are listed companies or not listed companies, it will also determine. For example, if you have hotels or if you have um, uh, electricity companies and so on and so forth, which, whether you can do partial or full asset sales, for example. Capital structure controls debt discipline. Uh, we look at Islamic finance that we have applied uh, or stable finance, M&A and external audits. So there are limits, as I said, there was change in policy after I left. Uh, I think there's less emphasis on the state side, although now, another change in government and but with the COVID crisis, I think there was a requirement for more active role of the state, uh, as, as, as we know. Not all SOEs were under this program. As you know, unfortunately in Malaysia, there's, there's been the big crisis of one MDB. They were not under this program. 
and perhaps had they been under this program that it wouldn't have ended that way but that was not under our jurisdiction uh, our airline like sri lankan airline is also one company i was not able to successfully turn around uh, despite many attempts uh, as you know it's a very unfortunate sector very difficult sector we can discuss later about proton actually we sold this and later uh, the, uh, the Chinese company, Geely, who also owns Volvo, came in. And there is now some semblance of a turnaround in the Proton car company. So I don't think I have time to go through, but these are references on some examples of those 10 factors, getting the, you know, the pragmatism of using state and market instruments, uh, as well as what we call a sovereign development fund in the case of Kazana. And this chart actually illustrates the pendulum that swings between state and markets. And this is our history uh, in Malaysia from the time of, uh, of independence in 1957. You can see that this, this pendulum tends to swing between, between the two. And understanding these dynamics, I think, is key. Because finally, um, to, to run through uh, the lessons and applicability, my first point is a very simple one. Is I think each country must obviously decide its own mix and sequence of state and market instruments based on your own national objectives, obviously, balancing, uh, uh, in this case, fiscal uh, considerations, efficiency, economic sovereignty, employment, social policy, and so on, right? The, the design and uh, playbooks, uh, so-called, including ours, I think there's, there's a lot that you can, as you can see, and I've, I've read some of the literature and discussion in Sri Lanka itself. So therefore, vicarious lessons can be learned and indeed, they can be customized. So I'll end with basically, you know, three, three, three points. As, as we can see, uh, you know, I can testify the execution obviously is key, but it's a very detailed thing. And this is a long game. Very important that if you start something like this, you have to stay the course. But we will also say that both the price, you know, the benefits as well as the price uh, of doing, of not doing or, or doing this badly is also large. Eh? So on, on that note, I think um, uh, wish wish the very best uh, to Sri Lanka in, in this journey of yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Tansri, uh, for that uh, valuable presentation uh, in which you address the role played by Kazana in driving state enterprises in Malaysia. Uh, perhaps we could revisit that the topic of whether we need an entity like Kazana in Sri Lanka uh, later on during our panel discussion. 